Well, very good evening to everyone. It's good to be together again. And I appreciate another opportunity to share some of my studies of God's Word with you. Uh, some things to announce. There was the sermon not long ago about are you tired of all the religious division? And a couple people had some things to say, hey, what about this or that? So it's short to are you tired of religious division? I thought that was a good point. And, uh, somebody had also said something about the time of Bible class on the back and moving that to after the time of the service so it's, it's not as confusing. Uh, that's done as well. These are printed up on, you might be able to see, it's not just white paper, it's a heavier paper and it's called parchment. Uh, but it looks good. That way it'll stand out. If you want to use these things, I've got, I don't know, over a hundred of them in the foyer in that little uh, thing on the back. So if you want to use them, if you're sending in bills that are anywhere in the local area, you'd be surprised how many people, when you're sending a bill to Anchorage, have ties to things down here. Um, but uh, it, whatever it may be, handing them out around the neighborhood, anything like that, if you want those, they are certainly there to use. And in case you don't have a copy of the lesson, uh, those are in the foyer in the little basket as well. So can we know God's Word? We looked this morning at basically what the Old Testament had to say and saw that there's not an option. God says, yes, you can, and yes, you will know His Word and know Him. So in taking a look at some of these things, we're going to look at what the New Testament says tonight. There is one passage that we'll look at from the Old Testament just briefly. But our first point, as you'll look at on the uh, outline, the Bible is the truth. And we're going to just kind of fly through these. We've got a lot of passages to look at, and I don't want to be here till midnight. So uh, the first one is John 17, 17. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus tells the Father, please, you know, he's asking, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Remember when Pilate was frustrated with Jesus and the situation? And he says, what is truth? And I'm going to see him be exasperated when he asks that. What is truth? We can find truth. The capital T, truth, is out there. It's God's Word. So, God's Word is truth. And we see that God's Word is truth on the outline. But then, let's look at a couple of other points. Lack of knowledge is true ignorance. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. I, I don't watch Oprah, but I heard that that's a big thing that she's going back into now, saying, just find your own way and it's all good. Oh, no, that you don't find your own way. Those that try to find their own way, well, we talked about flying IFR this morning. Those, those are the people who smack the mountains. Those are the people who go upside down into the sea. They don't arrive safely at their destination the way they had planned. Revelation 19, verse 13. I want you to imagine how the Lord paints you and me a picture of Himself. You know, people think of God, and He's this grandfatherly figure with the long flowing beard, and He pats people on the head and says, Oh, now let me give you a hug. That's not who God is. God cares for us, but He's not some pushover grandfatherly figure. And look at Jesus. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and His name is called the Word of God. Do you want to trifle with someone who can honestly paint themselves as that? Not a chance. Who is Jesus, the one with the robe dipped in blood? It's the Word of God. Do you want to know the Word of God? Yes. Do you want to be on the right side of the Word of God? Absolutely. So we go to Romans, 4, uh, Romans 10. Yeah, Romans 10, verse 14. How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe on Him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. That's what the gospel means. Good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who's believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Faith. People say, well, I have faith that this is okay. Faith comes from the Word of God. I can't have faith in something because I feel something. 
That's not how it works. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed, their sound has gone out to all the earth and their words to the end of the world. There is no excuse for people who say, well, I just have faith. But they can't back it up with the scriptures. In 1 Peter 1, verse 22 that you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren. Love one another fervently with a pure heart. We've been talking about this in the class on 1 John. Love one another. Love one another. But we've also been incorporating what does that mean? We don't just say love one another and leave it there. John talked about it. We've talked about it because God's words talked about it. It's what it means. It's not a matter of what I feel like, because that's not what matters. It's what God says, and we were talking in class this morning about the agape love, which is not always a love that people appreciate, because sometimes it means saying, hey, I think there's a problem here. We need to talk about it. But look at what he says in verse 23. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God. Do you realize that the Mormons, the Muslims, the Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, the list goes on and on, they all have something in common. They say, well, the Word of God was corrupted. The Word of God was corrupted. Do you see that the God who gave this said it is incorruptible? It is not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible. What seed? The Word of God. It's incorruptible. The Spirit gave it. The Spirit protects that and gives that to us through the, through the years. Can you find bad versions of the Scriptures? Oh, yeah. Can you be diligent to handle God's Word accurately and find good ones? Yes, you can. Because all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of the grass. The grass withers, its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which, the, which by the gospel was preached to you. That word endures forever. So we go to Roman numeral 2. The opposite of the gospel is darkness. It's not freedom to do as you want. The world makes it into all kinds of things like that. No, take a look at this. Luke 11, verse 33. Jesus says, No one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand that it may give uh, that, that those who come in may see the light. The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body is full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body also is full of darkness. There was a member of the church in, uh, in Borger, Texas, and I remember asking her. She had been blind since about five, six years old, something way back there. And she's an older woman. And I asked her, do you remember seeing things? Oh, yes, she smiles. I remember seeing things. What do you remember? The best thing I remember, and I think of it often, is just watching the raindrops hit the window. And she describes different things. She described how her parents looked. She described different things. When your eye is bad, your body is also full of darkness. He's not talking about our vision capabilities. He's talking about our heart. Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. Don't you know people who say, I have the light. I know the truth. I'm a faithful Christian. I'm a child of God. But they don't have the light. What do they have? Their light is darkness. They don't know what they don't know. Why is that? Because they don't study God's Word. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light, as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. In Roman numeral number three, God wants us all to be saved. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And we'll look at this one first, First Timothy 2, verse 3. This is a good and accept, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. He doesn't say, put up your hands and say, I love Jesus, and it's okay. 
He says, you need to know the Word. We've got to know the Word. And coming to that knowledge is not something impractical or unbecoming to a Christian. It's something God requires of us. Knowledge of the truth. Uh, and by the way, yes, I know people who have a photographic memory and can quote scriptures frontwards and backwards from almost anywhere in the Bible. Yeah, it makes me jealous too. I don't have that. I can't even remember my kids' names sometimes. But what we can do is have a working knowledge of the scriptures and say, I know where I can find that. Give me just a minute and I'll go find it. We don't have to be able to have that photographic instant recall of every passage, but a working knowledge. That's what God wants us to have. And look here at 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so, not willing that any should perish, if you're following along in our interactive outline. And then look at God's equivocations. God is making these things equal. Equivocation is making things equal. Ephesians 6, verse 10. He says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. If you haven't read that and pondered those words, that is frightening. That is scary stuff. Exactly what does he mean? I'll have to tell you, I don't know. I cannot tell you exactly what that means and what it doesn't mean. I can tell you it is scary and it is sobering. Oh, why are you saying it's scary, Greg? Because that part's scary. But what he tells us is how to deal with it. That part is very comforting. So even though I don't know exactly where those attacks come from in exact detail, Look at the rest. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. When it's all said and done, you will not be knocked down. You will still be standing if you're faithful. Now, look at this equivocation down in verse 14. What he summarizes this as, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet in the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you'll be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. All of these are the same thing. You can't have one without the other. What is truth? It's the way of righteousness. What is righteousness? It's the gospel. What is the gospel? It's the one faith that we are to have. We'll talk more about that later. It's the way of salvation. It is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. So in number four, God's word commands our obedience. It is not something we have a choice about. There are passages in God's word that are absolutely hard to do. When loved ones are involved and God says you will separate yourself from them, you will withdraw yourself from them, that is hard. That is vomit hard. It is not something I want to do, but it is something I will. Truth is knowable. John 8 verse 31, Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Notice there is no uh, room for wiggle on this. There is no room. You must abide in my word. If, in geometry that would be spelled I-F-F, -F, as in if and only if, because there's no exception to it. In John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. And someone, I put a red letter only. You'll notice I put those in red. Because some folks are hung up on that and say, well, it says His commandments. It doesn't say Paul's. Because, you know, Paul, he was just something else. It's not what Jesus would say. Well, yeah, because remember what Jesus said about the Spirit coming? The Spirit would guide them into all truth, and He was not speaking of His own because He would speak what Jesus was there to say. But He said some of these things you can't bear right now. But the Spirit will guide you into all truth. So, black letters, red letters, the commandments, 
the will of the Lord. And also note that it's not up to me to decide. It's not up to you to decide or anybody else for that matter. 2 Peter 1.19 And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. That morning star is referring to Jesus. Verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. So I think that came out blue. That's supposed to be purple. If you're looking for answers uh, in the outline. Interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. It's not up to me to say, well, I think you've seen people sell books by the truckload because they tell you what they think that some prophecy means. And it's whatever's in the news nowadays. That's what, that's what it's all about. And then when that goes away, it's about something else. God tells us what it's about. Do you see how many prophecies from Old Testament Scripture we see explained for us in New, if we look carefully for them? Matthew 7, 24. Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them. I liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rock. I've capitalized it down here. It should have been up there as well because who's he talking about? That rock that followed them was Jesus. The rock. Not a rock. The rock. And the rain descended. The floods came. The winds blew and beat on that house. It didn't fall. For it was founded on the rock. And rock is one of those words that we're looking for in the outline. And then, of course, the sand. Well, that didn't go well. The shifting sands. That's what it's usually called. Shifting sands are not something you want to build on. Shifting sands are not something you can navigate by. Shifting sands are not something you want to be around because well, they kind of swallow things up. That's what following the philosophy of mankind will do for everyone every time. Look at John 14, 23. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. The word that the Spirit continued to reveal to the holy men of God after Jesus had ascended. It's not just the red letter part. And my Father will love him. He will, uh, we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. You've heard people say, I know we don't have authority for it, but this is a good thing. That's not what Jesus says. People want to say, well, you know, this Christianity stuff, that's just slavery. That's just slavery to some religion. And I'm going to be free. Got news for you. You are a slave. You and I are all slaves. You say, well, you mean to uh, corporate America? No. No. We're slaves. Either to God or the powers of darkness, which would mean the devil. It's one or the other. Romans 6, verse 15, What then shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey? whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be think that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, and having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I'll let you read the rest of that, but the concept is very clearly established. There's no fence. There's no medium. We're slaves of the devil and of death. We're slaves. And Jesus says, Come unto me, for my yoke is non existent. His yoke is easy, his burden is light. But there is a yoke to wear, there is a burden to bear in Christianity. Because we don't just do our own thing either way. We are slaves. There it goes again. Ephesians 5 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. How could we imitate God if we don't know God? We have to know Him, and that only comes through His Word. That's how we imitate God. 
Ephesians 5, verse 8. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Look at this. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Yes, he says your responsibility is to find out what is responsible to the Lord. How do you know that? God shows us through His Word. It takes a working knowledge of God's Word. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. How do we know what is darkness and what is not? Except a working knowledge of God's Word. For any shame will even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret, but all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, the Word. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. How do you awaken? How do you grow? If it's not a working knowledge of God's Word and obedience to that. So what's the difference here? Romans 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We walk in a new life. If you're following on, on the uh, outline. We walk in a new life life. It's very different. How do we know what that new life is? God's Word shows us. So let's reflect for a moment on God's Hall of Faith. This is halfway down the last section on the front of the page. Throughout Hebrews 11, each of the characters acted by faith and pleased God. That's the whole gist of Hebrews 11, character by character by character. Well, the first question, did they do what they thought that God might like? Nope. Did they do what seemed good to a group of people? Nope. Did they do what God instructed them to do? Every time. By faith, and you look at which character it is and what that character did. Man, woman, young or old. What they did was what God said to do. They knew God's word. They did God's word. Now, how much did the details really matter? How much did the details really matter? The reason I'm wanting to spend a moment on this, how many times have you heard people say, you're just getting bogged down in details. You need to look at the big picture. What do you think God really meant? I know God said that, but that, that can't be what he really meant. Go back to the question, did the details really matter? Abraham could have said, I will offer a son, not mine. I'm going to offer my servant's son. Or I'll just pick one up along the way. I'll just take somebody's son and I'll go offer him. I'd be glad to. But he didn't do that because details matter. Noah might have had, hey, there's other wood. It's a lot more accessible. Can you imagine the cost or just the time? If Noah built an ark, of the dimensions that the Bible says. Do you think he just got those trees from his yard? How far do you think he had to go to get the last of those trees to bring them in, whatever gopher wood was? That would be a demanding task. I don't care if he lived in a forest. To make that ark as big as that was. And this next one, this is not being funny. If you haven't spent time in a prison, I wasn't an inmate, I was a teacher there. I got to go home at night. My conclusion is, if you're not already messed up and you go to prison, you will be. That is not a pleasant place. That is not a good place. It is not set up for rehabilitation. It's, it's a mess. Joseph could have joined a prison gang and forgotten all about the Lord. Because what are gangs about? Gangs are some sort of family. They're some sort of alternative life. And these are the people you can count on. Joseph could have had those opportunities. Joseph said, I will put my faith in God. 
Don't you know there were people who said, Joseph, have you looked around? You keep talking about putting your faith in God. Do you not see where you're at? Your family threw you out, and it's just gone from worse to worse to even worse again. Joseph said, I will put my faith in God. Look at this razor's edge in 2 John 9, going through verse 11. Whoever is very broad, whoever transgresses, that just means step over. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. Abiding is a full-time job. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. So that's not something that we want. That is not an alternative. That is a razor's edge of it's good or it's bad, and we must know that difference. In this one, it's not to be sarcastic, asking at the top, so is this saying that we should feel holy? No, not at all. What is it saying? 1 Peter 1, verse 13, Therefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children. There's a revelation. We're obedient to it. It's not just saying the revelation of Jesus Christ as in when he returns, but I believe he's also talking about the revelation of the word. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Do you realize this is a command? This is a command to be holy for I am holy, period. It doesn't say unless it's just too hard. Obedience. We don't just feel holy. We are obedient to be holy. Knowing His will and doing it. Romans 1 verse 18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. These people who say we can't know what God's Word says. We can't say that this is right or this is wrong. We can't do that. They are suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. God is not speaking highly of this, but condemning it. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. There's no excuse. And this is uh, next to a uh, third one up from the bottom of the page. Slackers are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they didn't glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. You look at any show on TV, you look at any magazine article, you look at anything that you can imagine where people talk about evolution, people in some way diminish God, uh, whatever it may be. And they want to show you how they are intellectual and above your intellect. They are very, very high. And they might put that uh, British accent in there because that's perceived as being more intellectual professing to be wise, they became fools. They're denying basic things that God has shown us all along. Look down in verse 24. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. This is an act of selfishness. <laughs> They worship the creature. Which creature do you think they love the most? Themselves. Because that's what makes them feel good. That's what they think is important. Even if it's that they're out there, uh, you know, save the raccoons or whatever their cause may be, and they put that first and foremost in their life, that's what they decided is good. That's what makes them feel good. They exchange the truth of God for the lie. And remember that lie? The serpent said to the woman, No, you'll not surely die. God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, I'll be like God. Why, that's, that's impressive. I, I 
think I'll take some of that. And she did. That lie is something that continues with us even to today. You can make the decisions. You can call the shots. You know what is good and right. You have answers that you can prove for yourself. No, we don't. We're flying blind. We need God. And Romans 12, 1, 2, and 3. We're going to look at verse 3 in the next slide here. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. We talked about sacrifice this morning and how it is something that's very important. You can't serve God under the old law without sacrifice. But we looked at more than one passage saying, well, the sacrifice does you no good until you love God and you put Him first. That you're obedient in everything. It's not about checklists to say, well, I offered my sacrifice, but I'm okay. Your bodies are a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. What? I have to live as a sacrifice to God? Back to that concept of slavery. That's what we're here for. It's to serve God. And that's our reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How can we prove it? We can show it through our actions. We can prove it from book, chapter, and verse, going to God's Word. We continue in verse 3. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought. What's he warning against? How about the lie? How about, yeah, well, I think, I feel, I've decided, because those things don't matter. He says, who are you? We don't matter. It's what God said that matters. So on the back of the back page, knowing God's Word requires work and study. It's not through osmosis, as Mark was talking about this morning. I, I've heard instead of putting it on the forehead, I've heard people say, I put it under my pillow. And uh, I'll absorb it that way. There we go. Galatians 5, verse 24. Those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Do you see what that's saying? Back to the slavery. Back to the concept of I live for the Lord. If we've crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, then I think, I feel, I want, I've decided... They don't matter. We crucified them. So they're left hanging in the breeze where you can look out and say, that's the old person. I'm not going back to that. It's dead. It's there as a symbol. Mark 12, verse 30, And you shall love the Lord your God with most of your heart. What does God require of us? All your heart. All your soul. All your mind. All your strength. <laughs> Oh, wait a minute, what's left for me? Nothing. We are slaves of God to do His will. Don't you feel very blessed that we have a generous, loving God? More than just a taskmaster or a slave owner. It's our God. Satan would fit the bill for those other things. God is loving toward us gives us good things. And when He gives us things to do, it may not seem good, but it's always for our good. In Matthew 6, verse 31, Therefore don't worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? After all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. All these things shall be added to you. Seek. Seek. It's not just there in your face. You've got to work for it to find it, but it can be done. But he said, seek first. What, what's a priority? There is no priority higher than seeking and doing God's will. And the concept of malleability. God allows His Word to be malleable for most people. Malleable. They can hammer it into anything they want it to be. Doesn't mean it'll work. But they can do that. Take like Peter 3 verse 16. And also in all his epistles, speaking in them of things in which are some things hard to understand. He's, this is Peter talking about Paul. Some of that stuff he says is hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destructions. 
uh, destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. He says, yeah, they twist some of the hard things. Some people say <laughs> that there's hard stuff to understand. That means that Paul wrote Hebrews. Well, that's not necessarily true. But the point that this is drawing out is, not only do they take the hard things and twist that to their own destruction, they do that with all the scriptures. That's not something that we want to do. Is it that the scriptures are that easy to twist? Or is it that easy that people can be untaught and unstable? God's word is not something that is easy to twist, but it can be done. People do it all the time. Look at the responsibility that God gives us here in 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. He says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God. I don't have to make my parents happy. I don't have to make my friends happy. I don't have to make the elders happy. I don't have to make anybody happy but God. Because people may say, how dare you? Can you imagine Paul coming to see his family after he had converted to Jesus? And saying, let me explain some of these things to you. There's nobody in the house that would probably be happy at all. But he says you need to be approved by God. A worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, rightly dividing or handling accurately the word of truth. And on this one, oh, I get lost in my notes. Uh, there it is, the last one under Roman numeral 5 up on top of the page. Handling accurately is also translated as, that's A-T-A, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we go to our next point. Roman, Roman numeral 6, there is one faith. Well, obviously, we start off at Ephesians 4, verse 4, but somebody asked, of which faith are you? Well, I'm this, and I'm that, and, how, and this one's over here. And So which faith are you? Well, well, there is one body. The reason I capitalize body, Colossians 1, verse 22 and 23, tells us that the body is the church. There is one body, meaning there's one church. And one spirit, just as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith. One baptism, one God, Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. One church, one body, one faith. People say, well, of course there's one body. You know, everybody, everybody who loves Jesus is in the one body. So which faith are you? Well, there's, there's only one faith. There's only one. Galatians 1, verse 6. Remember... Is there another gospel? No. I marvel at your tuning, turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Would you want that label given by God? God's the one giving this, not Paul. It's through inspiration Paul writes. God says some people pervert the gospel. I do not want that ever associated with my name. Perverting the gospel. But even if we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. It doesn't matter which angel. It doesn't matter what fancy golden plates he brings. It doesn't matter what people say. If it's not the 2,000 year old record from God, then it's not what we need. And it's not what will save us. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. means He breathed it. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete. Complete uh, means uh, perfect in some versions. Uh, in the sense, perfect in the sense of being complete with nothing lacking. Thoroughly equipped for every good work. And the good work is what we're looking at. Uh, in the notes I put down, if there's no Bible authority, then we know it is not a good work. Greg, it's not in there, but this is such a good thing. Uh, no. No, it is not. Ephesians 5, verse 27, also on this. That he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. How does the church maintain that standard? Knowing, doing God's will. If there's no authority, it's not to be done. We can know God's word. And he holds us to that standard. So in Roman numeral 7, 
We are to draw lines of fellowship. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, look at Romans 10, verse 1. He said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. I don't want that being said about me, do you? You don't want that said about you. That's a bad thing. Who would be responsible if we show up on the day of judgment and the Lord says you're ignorant of God's righteousness? Who's to blame? It's not God. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 7. To give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire taking vengeance on those. Look at those, those phrases. Those who do not know God. Well, what about those people in the darks of Africa? What about those aborigines way in the interior of, of Australia? What about those people in the South Pacific Islands? And they just had no way to know. What was it Jesus said? Well, first Romans 1, we talked about that already, that they are without excuse to not seek God. But Jesus says, seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open. Ask and you will receive. There's no excuse. Doesn't matter who. If they don't know God, flaming fire of vengeance. And on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, that's a pretty serious thing. And that's something that happens all around us on a regular basis. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 4, 6. <clears throat> I just had this uh, in a conversation with somebody just in the past couple of days. They were saying, Greg, you are violating this passage. I am. I would like to know how, because if I'm violating that passage, I need to change. If you can show me from God's word where I'm wrong, I have to change. Go back to the slavery point. It's not my choice. Now these things, brethren, I figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. The point was being made to me, if you condemn people who are doing things, you're the one that's puffed up and you're thinking beyond what is written because God didn't give authority to condemn them. So wait a minute, you're talking about things that we don't have authority to do, so who's the one going beyond what we're what is written? They're going beyond what is written to go do things, and I'm saying that's wrong. And they're saying, oh, you're violating this passage. Do you see that? That's the way a lot of people want to apply that. That is in error. Not to think beyond what is written, let alone do beyond what is written. Don't even think beyond what is written. Wouldn't it be nice if we could? No, 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 don't even go there. 1 Corinthians 5, 6, Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. What's he saying? He's saying leavening is contagious. Oh, I lost my place again in my notes. But he's saying that leavening is contagious. There it is. Uh, leaven is a lack of complete obedience to God. Roman numeral 8, not everyone wants to accept the Word of God. There is no way. I wish they did, but, you know, Spanish Inquisition was all about taking a sword and making people convert, or at least what they thought was making people convert. It doesn't work that way. 2 Corinthians 4, 1, therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. We have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the Word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it, you know, people say, I just can't understand that. I can't see that point. It's veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. Who is it that's causing them to not see the gospel? The God of this age. If you're keeping up with your notes. And then uh, also in Ephesians 4, verse 17, 
This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk in the rest of the, gen rest of the Gentiles. Walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. And he says they walk in greediness. They thought, they felt, they decided. There's nothing new under the sun. Ignorance, greediness, it's doing what they want to do and not worrying to find anything else. Down in Roman numeral 9, this one's very short, it's only one passage. We can know God and His Word. There are a lot of passages we could put here, but John 17, 3, and this is eternal life that they may know you and only true, but the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. You notice he, he didn't say they can. He said they may. That denotes not only can, but it's their option. It's possible, but they can choose. And finally, Roman numeral 10. Consider which answer you want in the end. There are only two. The first one, remember Jesus gave this stinging rebuke. When Jesus answered them and said, you are therefore mistaken because you don't know the Scriptures nor the power of God. You know, yeah, he puts it as a question, are you? But it's a rhetorical question. You've missed the mark. You are mistaken because you don't know the Scriptures. That's not something we want to be told. But there's this answer. Or there's the answer that we all want. Matthew 25, verse 21, His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of your Lord. This was the five-talent man. And the same thing pretty much to the three-talent man. But not the one. Not the one who failed. Which is why we have the question mark. The answer we all want? Well, of course we all want that. Yeah, the one-talent man would have said so as well. But he didn't follow through. So I leave you with the question tonight. If we want to be ready when the Lord comes to settle the accounts, when we face the Lord in judgment, are you ready? Do you spend time to know God's will and have you dedicated yourself to doing it? If you haven't put on Christ in baptism, hearing God's word and believing it, repenting of your sins, confessing Jesus and being baptized for the forgiveness of sins, all things are ready. And if you've come to the Lord and been baptized into Christ, but you've just been having trouble with living faithfully until death, if we can pray with and for you, if there's any way we can help, come forward and let it be known as we stand and sing. Precious forever, oh.